This story is just going to build on the stories you've been hearing this morning. It's really going to be, I think you will see from really common themes and what's just been said, but I'll give you my story. Uh, it is a story. Um, those three things that are sort of headings that I'm going to talk about. Um, it might pay to sort of turn off the left side of your brain and perhaps engage the right side of the brain because it might be a little fast because you are a big audience, so I decided I'd do PowerPoints. I actually hate PowerPoints. But if you can look at them, you won't have to look at me so much, so it might be quite good. <laughs> so I, I'm going to talk about um, wholeness, and I'm going to start there because I'd actually like to talk a whole lot about wholeness and well-being and what it is to um, have health, uh, which is all to do with being whole and being connected. Um, I haven't got the time to do that, but I'll touch on it. Uh, and then I'm going to go through um, and get to water, and then we're going to... A sub-theme is going to be, or an example is going to be about sort of climate change. I guess. But what I really want to talk about is ecosystems and living systems on this planet and what's happening to them. Okay, so let's go. So wholeness um, and a holistic perspective, and I like to keep the W there because it's a whole, it's a whole view, it's not a hole in the ground sort of a thing. Um, and, and it's all about connections, it's about patterns of, ex of exchange, what's going on in, the, in terms of the integration and maintaining the contactivity all the time and everything we look at and think about and do, whether it's thinking or action or whatever. So I just want to, on this one, want to talk about ecological health. Well, what is ecological health? It's actually a rather difficult thing to think about. It's a difficult question as to what is eco ecological health. So I'm just going to give you one possibility here. It's really about the rate of, of turnover of nutrients, carbon and phosphorus and nitrogen, all these nutrients and everything that's going on, and the more it turns over and the more diverse pathways of, of, of all those interconnections is, then the healthier that ecosystem is. It's, it's, it's one measure maybe of health. There's, the, there's a lot going on and it's very complicated and it's all sort of supporting each other in a highly in interconnected way with a rapid turnover and that of fertility is a rapid turnover of, of nutrients. A um, couple of things about what that might mean, because um, it gets a little bit difficult, is that it means that it's, it's productive. It's not about maximising production, it's about productivity that supports all parts of, this, of the ecosystem or, or the, that, that living system. Um, and there's storages and sort of backups in terms of resilience, in terms of the shocks that might come or the changes that might come. So it has the ability to, to adjust and adapt. Um, another take on that is that it involves a lot of death. We tend to forget about that. When you're next going to eat some food, something's dying so that you can live. Okay, so life and death go together in a, in a healthy ecosystem. It's not just all about life and growth, right? Uh, and, and look at it another way, it's not all about regeneration either. There is growth, maturity and decay. So there's both regeneration and um, degeneration. I now want to look at something called worldviews. We all have a worldview. We have an individual worldview, we have a social group, community, a cultural one, a society one, we all have a world view and it's a sort of the default setting. When you don't quite know what to make of it, we go to our defaults. So I'm going to make an assumption that you can read here, that's our unconsciously held beliefs or assumptions about, what, about life and what it means that actually has the most influence on our actions. And we don't even know that we're doing it. We don't even know what those beliefs are. They just well down deep, but it makes a real difference to us. And so I just want to look at that in terms of this little diagram that a friend of mine drew, um, in terms of the world view that's sort of, it's interesting, the dominant world view, which is the world view of dominance <laughs> uh, at the moment, where nature is out there. Nature, it, that's a terrible word, nature, because as soon as you say nature, it's like we're not part of it. Right? It's something else. And, that, and we've come out of it, and we're now in control of it, and we can now make use of it. And that's a sort of dominance and control type of um, paradigm that we live in. And so if we think about that, and we're thinking about um, coming to the theme of climate change, well, the climate's changing all the time. Day and night, seasonally, year on year, the climate is continually changing. Right? So it's always changing, it always will change. And it's sort of been stated, and Charles sort of said it a bit as well. Thank you, Charles. But this could be a statement. I don't know how easy it is to read there, but this could be a rather raw but maybe more honest statement about what a lot of um, climate 
change activity might be about in terms of stabilising the climate, right? So it's the climate's changing and it's adversely affecting us and our lifestyle, then we must take action. We must be in control, so it's our responsibility to take action. For what? To keep the climate and the convenience and comfort of our present lifestyle. That's what a lot of climate change people talk about, keeping it like it is so we can keep on living like we are. Well, I'd like to question that. <laughs> I want to go then to water. So we're on a watery planet. That's um, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Oh, I can't see it on that. Somewhere down there, this, this shows us. Um, and that's half the globe. So we're in a very watery place of the globe. And I'm sure you know the, the uh, Goa hypothesis. And that is that where there's water, there's life. So I want to quickly just go through this and I'll just see how far I get. So let's say basically what life is about. Life is a synergy to me in very simplistic terms between water and carbon. Okay? And a little bit goes like this. In terms of water, well, it's a feedstock to start with. We talked about photosynthesis. Melissa talked about that. Water and CO2, sunlight, photosynthesis, makes carbohydrates. That's the energy of the whole system. That's how we build um, life. Right? But it's a lot more than that. It's actually the facilitator of all organic exchanges. Water is an incredibly unusual and strange molecule. Very basic, but very unusual. And it facilitates all exchanges of life. Um, and so it's, uh, it actually helps to distribute, and particularly liquid water, helps distribute nutrients around um, the, well, in the oceans, easy enough, and on, on, on land as well. Um, and that's really important because plants can't move, so nutrients have to come to them. And I'll talk a bit later about the air bringing also basic nutrients like water and CO2 to plants, because that's what they are, they're basic nutrients. Um, very importantly, uh, water is about distributing heat as well. And so the climate is really about water. The weather is all to do with water. That's what the weather is, it's water. Um, carbon is a very unusual, uh, well not unusual, it just happens to be a simple molecule that has this sort of four-way bonding, positive, negative, anions, cations, can sort of bond to it and it can bond to itself. And it can form sort of complex rings and chains and basically form very long, complex spiraling molecules. And that's what allows life. So the two go together, give you life. So let's look basically at a couple of basic cycles of life, of carbon and water. So let's start with carbon. Don't look too much at the, the that, trying to work it out, okay? It's just saying how carbon flows around through uh, ecosystems and soils and in the air and on land-based um, ecosystems there's this interplay between the land, the biomass and the atmosphere in terms of the whole interaction of it. And again this one here, don't you look too much time in it, but this is somebody who's trying to look at well what's the quantities, the storages and the fluxes of carbon in the world. And just look at on, 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 on the left-hand side, you'll see a, a sort of pinky thing. Now that's the carbon exchange going on through the atmosphere, um, through CO2 or methane or carbon monoxide. That's life. It's life's way of, of distributing carbon. And it's going on. If you look at the smaller little pink ones, that's the fossil fuel burning the fires. And that. It's actually quite a small percentage of what's going on anyway. It's a huge amount of carbon being recycled through the air anyway. And we might be adding a bit to it. Let's go to the water cycle. Pretty basic to life, as I've said, and, 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 and a whole lot of ways of having time to go into and how the water cycle works. But that's a really important part of the whole system of life, OK? Now, if we look at what we've done to it, and I'm sure you can go through all these things. I don't need to tell you what they are. But we've done lots of things that have affected the water cycle, right? including on waterways, but also on land, deforestation, and uh, what else got this? And soil loss and all that. That's all disrupting and interfering and affecting the water cycle. It's also affecting ecosystems, and they're both connected. So they affect ecosystems, which affect the water cycle, it affects the water cycle, which affects ecosystems. So the ability of life to do its thing uh, is affected by the disruption. This one is really, if we come to climate and global climate, to me anyway, it's all about the circulation of water and therefore heat. The sun's shining. It's more on the tropics than it always is. Water is used to distribute that heat around, as well as water itself. I mean, I mean, part of the life cycle of of, of life. So I just want to come to uh, this as an example a little bit in terms of um, 
of the climate. So let's look at the composition first. Very basic of the atmosphere, mostly nitrogen. Really interesting, isn't it? Another story as to why so much nitrogen in the air. Nearly th over three quarters of it. And then oxygen. Now on the right hand side there, there's water. Now people look at it as dry air or wet air because water goes in and out of the air all the time as water vapour, right? And then it comes down again as rain. And that's really important. And that's what this, it's, it's the greenhouse gas. That's the most important uh, greenhouse gas of the lot because it's the heat transfer, right? There's water. And then there's inert gases. Well, they just wander around and don't say anybody do anything. They just do their own thing, you know? So we don't have to worry about them too much. It's mainly argon and a few others. If we blow up that, again, 2% is about an average. That's up to 4% in the air can be water vapour. And it's coming and going. And then there's those inert fellows who just wander around and don't say hello to anybody. And then there's a bit of carbon. Carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, whatever, going around in the system. A very small part. It is a trace element going through the atmosphere, really doing its thing for life. And what impacts it has on the climate is really a side consequences from my point of view. So if we look at then some of the climate drivers, and I'll go through this quite quickly, because um, you probably know it all, but I want to make the point is that the biophysical process of life and climate are intimately connected. One affects the other. Climate affects life. Life affects climate. And if we, I think we need to get a head around that bigger picture of those interconnections and how it all works together and not concentrate, as some people have been making the point, on one part of it, which is the climate. So what are climate drivers? Let's say, what are the suspects, right? Well, clearly the biggest suspect is the sun, right? Because that's what brings the heat, brings the energy into the earth, and it's, uh, we have to deal with it, and life has to deal with it. And this is just a, a plot, and I'm sure you've seen in the sun's energy and the radiation varies, and that varies the amount of heat and radiation coming to the earth, and that affects the weather, obviously, and the climate and that sort of thing. And that's all fine, and there's various other things that happen. What about the moon? Well, there's a bit of different opinion about what effect the moon has and on our weather and that, but from my point of view, since it affects water in a, in a huge way and affects us, our bodies are water, and actually the moon's coming and going and affecting you all the time. Uh, in fact, so I think it is actually having an effect on the weather. <laughs> um, whether it's making much change in, it in the present time, well, that might be a different story. So maybe it's not such a big suspect. The Earth itself clearly is. It's got its own heat source. Uh, we all know about volcanoes, in fact, volcanoes, and what that does to the climate. Okay, and this happens to be um, the, the Ruapahu eruption in 1995, a really small one. But we're in a high energy place here. <laughs> right on the ring of fire and all this weather that comes around us. So um, we know about the Earth being a bit active around here. And then there's life itself as a whole. Now, I just like this diagram because it's a representation of proteins. But life is always interacting with climate. So there's always goings-on between climate and life. If I put this one up, now this is a, a view right back in time, and it's a little compressed view, so it's like... As you go further back in time, it's a psychological view of time and it gets more compressed as you go back in time. And I think it's quite a good human view of time, this. Um, but what it shows is temperature against geological time up to the present. And what it demonstrates is we're actually in a cold period at the moment. The Earth is cooled and we're in quite a cold period with these really quite short, sharp, warm intervals. And the Holocene is just the most recent of the last four or five of those intervals. And that's going to keep going. These drivers, these changes are not stopping uh, just because we're around. They are continuing to do their thing. So let's come to the prime suspect, the problem. What's our human activity and what effect does that have on it? I want to talk about the difference between sources and sinks. I think it's really important. I think Charles has already sort of raised this issue. Um, the sources of CO2 going into the air and the sinks when it's taken out of the air as it's been recycled by life. Now clearly we are burning fossil fuels and that's increasing the sources of CO2. And clearly we are burning plants and crops and that's increasing the sources of CO2. Okay. Don't breathe. You're letting out CO2. Okay. So be careful. Don't belt your fart either, actually. <laughs> and, and what about... Our animals, and which animals? Is it our domesticated animals? Is it all animals? I'll come to that something. 
What about the sinks? Well, I'm afraid there's a whole long list of what we're doing in terms of reducing the ability of life to take carbon out of the atmosphere again. You know, we're clearing forests, we're draining wetlands, we're, we're um, poisoning the soil as well as tilling it. We're doing all sorts of things to the, to the ocean and wrecking ecosystems. We're polluting waterways, we're um, putting plastics, as has been mentioned, into our, into our oceans. We're doing a lot of disruptive biotechnology, which is affecting ecosystems. There's a long, long list of what we're doing to our living systems on this earth, of which we're actually an intimate part of. And that, to me, is the thing we should be focusing on. That's the bigger picture of what we're doing to all these ecosystems, mountains to the bottom of the sea. We're affecting ecosystems, we're degrading them, and therefore they're less able to make use of the carbon that's meant to be going around. It's left in the air, nowhere to go. Where do I go? I'm left here. Okay? So I, that's the point I really want to come back to in terms of it's really about the sinks. So it's not so much the burning of fossil fuels that's the issue, but it's actually the, the, what we do with the burning in terms of the machines that then are powered by cheap energy and degrade in, in ecosystems. That's the real issue of what we're doing with it. So it's the use we're making of fossil fuels <coughs> to degrade rather than regenerate, to be on top of and impose rather than to be with and work with in that. So it's, that's, a, that's actually my key message in a way. So let's just think about carbon accounting and, and if, if we're going to understand uh, what's going on here, and, and, and my story is not about facts and figures, it's about understanding the values and priorities. We really need to see the bigger picture of what's going on. And nature doesn't care whether an animal's domesticated or it's wild. It has the same impact. What's important is whether it's a healthy ecosystem or a degraded ecosystem. Now, the ones on the left are pretty degraded ecosystems, and that's a problem. It's not that they're farmed, it's they're degraded. It's not that the dairy farming is wrong, it's that the, what Melissa was, I 100% agree with, it's about how we can farm grasslands with large animals, which are a natural ecosystem in this world, in a way that is uh, healthy for the environment, and lots of soil life, which means lots of carbon, and the fastest way of sequestering carbon out of the air is grazing large animals on grasslands. That's the fastest way. It won't be the most, but it's the fastest way if you want to do that. So why aren't we considering that in our accounting? Because we don't. When we talk about agriculture in New Zealand, where's the accounting for people who sequester carbon in the soil? And we're in the equation. One underneath, it's not just the machines that are burning uh, fuels, it's the lack of diversity in that field that would have been there taking up carbon and a wheat field takes up very little. Okay. So the last thing I really want to say is about carbon action and regeneration and I'll leave it to uh, Kay and Bob to talk a bit about regeneration and, and that's, <laughs> that's a big issue and <laughs> I haven't got time to go on to it. But the last speaker talked about plastics in the sea. Now what's the implication of that on the water cycle and the carbon cycle? What about all those plastic floating on the ocean and in fact on ev evaporation? That's the way you, you reduce evaporation, you put a, a plastic film over water, plastic bubbles. Okay. What's the effect on the ecosystems that degrade in it and therefore not allowing it to take up uh, carbon? That's the issue. Now a while ago, um, people used to talk about burning plastic, incinerating it, or a better gasification, gasification, which actually takes it and uses it as energy, because it's just like fossil fuels, it's just been changed into another form, you can burn it. And that takes it right back to CO2 and H2O. It's the best way of breaking down. It's the only way to really break things down by fire. That's the cleanser. Right? We don't do it because they say it's putting CO2 into the air. Well, what's the consequences of that? In terms of now all this plastic going around the world. There's all sorts of things about why we should do it. The last bit is, I don't know whether this is photoshopped or not, but there's ways of doing it and ways of not doing it. Uh, you can incinerate or you can not incinerate very well. So my last slide, I think, is a much deeper issue than just worrying about climate change. It's a deeper issue about our whole way of living, and we have to change our whole way of living in a transformative way to have healthy ecosystems, and we be a part of a healthy ecosystem, intimately connected to it. That's what we've got to do, and it's much harder than just saying, we shall control the climate or we shall make it better for us. Thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of it.